wonderful to see you all here. Um, and, uh, and if anyone's not been to an Action for Happiness event before, a very warm welcome. Delighted to see you all here this evening. My name is Mark Williamson. I'm going to very quickly say a, little, a couple of words about Action for Happiness and then we'll introduce Adam Grant. I'm delighted that we've got Adam here this evening for this fascinating topic uh, that I'm, I'm sure we're going to get a lot out of. Um, Action for Happiness is a movement of people who are united by a, a belief that what really matters in life is human happiness and well-being. It matters for us as individuals, it matters for our organisations, our communities and of course our nation as a whole. We do a lot of work on this theme of giving. I mean our whole ethos is about real happiness comes when we care more about the happiness of other people. Um, and we often look at that in the context of community or individual lives, acts of kindness. We've had wonderful events in this room on the theme of generosity and other ideas. But very rarely does that span the business world. Often when we go to work, we're not thinking about giving. We're not necessarily thinking, unless we work in, let's say, a, a sort of social innovation or the charity sphere, our primary focus in work is not necessarily on on giving to others, in fact, quite often the opposite. I think what we're going to hear about tonight is a narrative that's so vital because it turns that sort of conventional business logic on its head. Uh, and I won't sort of steal Adam's thunder, but I think what he, we're going to hear this evening is really quite profound for us as individuals, but also for the way we run our organisations and the way we structure our, our economy as well. Um, but I'm not going to introduce Adam myself. I'm going to, to do that, I'm going to ask one of our, my colleagues at Action for Happiness, uh, Vanessa King, to come and join us because she knows Adam well. And I'd also like to take the chance to, to, to recognise a giver, actually. We're going to talk about givers and takers this evening. Vanessa is somebody who has given so much to this whole movement. She helped us create the 10 keys to happier living. She co-authored and, in fact, wrote the majority of content on our website. She's given boundless hours of time and energy to help make this initiative a success, as have many others. Um, so I'd just like to say, I'd take a chance to say thank you to her for being a, a natural giver, someone who gives their time freely with no expectation of return. So please join me in welcoming Vanessa King. Thank you. That's uh, rather embarrassing, but um, rather nice as well. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Adam here tonight um, for a number of reasons, really. I could say, you know, it's because he's the youngest tenure professor at Wharton, one of the top business schools in the world. I could say it's because he's won numerous teaching awards, including the single highest rated um, MBA professor at Wharton. I could say it's because he's written probably a, around 70 peer-reviewed academic papers that have featured very heavily in many, many popular books, so that, such as those by Daniel Pink and um, Susan Cain. He's also been featured very widely in the press, from esteemed tomes such as the Oprah magazine right through to the New York Times. And I could, or I could say it's because of his consulting work in organisations, both the profit sector and the not-for-profit sector. I could even say it's because he's a former springboard diving champion, <laughs> or a magician, or is really into ultimate frisbee. Not, I have no idea what that means, but um, you know, there we go. But actually, for me personally, two reasons stand out. And Adam was my professor for my master's dissertation. I think primarily for me, it's because his work, even though he's a business school professor, his work is driven not primarily to help organisations increase productivity or profit, um, but to make them places that people can flourish, both professionally and personally. In short, I think for me, is he's at the leading edge of trying to change our business culture and make organisations more human places to be. And I think the second one is a more personal one, um, because I do know Adam and I have been on the receiving end of his giving. And it's for me because he doesn't just write about giving, he lives it. He's, you know, he's driven, he literally walks the talk. So for me that means that speaks volumes. So I'm very pleased to welcome to the stage Adam Grant. Good evening, everyone. It's a real honor to be here. I feel very tall all of a sudden, except for those of you in the balcony. 
Uh, I'm really delighted to have a chance to share some ideas with you all. Uh, this is the first stop outside of the United States on Give and Take. So all of the things that people in the US liked, you all are going to hate and vice versa. So I've tried to do the exact opposite of everything that worked in the US in the hopes that we will, we will potentially hit something interesting. What I want to do is, uh, is take about the next 40 to 45 minutes to tell you about some of my favorite ideas in give and take and give you a taste of, of why I think they're interesting and, and potentially powerful for individuals, for groups, and for organizations. Then we'll do a little bit of a breakout exercise to think about how can we apply some of this to our own lives or our own work. And then finally, we'll open it up for Q&A and I will attempt to answer any questions that you have. The place I want to start is with a simple question. So I wrote this book to figure out how do you all own this space? And what does it take for people to achieve success at work and in life? I'm trained as an organizational psychologist, and traditionally we answer this question in three ways. Hard work, talent, and luck. If you want to excel at anything, you're supposed to put in a lot of time and energy, achieve true mastery, and probably find yourself in the right place at the right time. I think that's all true. But what was missing for me from that picture of the individual forces that drive success was our interactions with other people. We all live and work in a connected world. You can think about the number of teams that you've been on recently, the number of clients and customers that you serve, perhaps the number of bosses that you have, although those of you who are having to count, I'm a little worried about your organization. But what I wanted to know was how do these interactions with all the people who make up our professional lives really shape our results and our achievements. And as I was starting to begin to answer that question, I came across a really inspiring quote. It was by Robert Benchley, and he said, there are only two kinds of people in the world. Those who divide the world into two kinds of people and those who don't. <laughs> I thought that was profound. I thought it was a great jab at psychologists who take all of the richness and complexity of human nature and oversimplify it using just two categories. And I swore after coming across that quote that I would never be guilty of doing such violence to the human condition. Which is why I am proud to announce to all of you that after a decade of research on the motives that people bring to their interactions, you need not two but three categories to capture pretty much everything we need to know. I call, them, I call these, uh, these reciprocity styles because they capture our, our motives, our habits, and our instincts when we're exchanging something of value with another person or group. Now, it's worth noting that there is evidence in all the seriousness across cultures, across industries, across time, that there really are three fundamental styles of interaction that capture reciprocity. On one end of the spectrum, we have the takers, the people who are just driven to get as much as possible from others, never want to give anything back, and specialize in critical skills like shirking, social loafing, free riding, credit hogging, backstabbing, all in service of making sure that they succeed at the expense of those around them. On the other end of the spectrum, we have these strange people that I call givers. I'm not necessarily talking about philanthropists or volunteers, but rather people who enjoy helping others, who often go out of their way to share knowledge, to provide mentoring, to make introductions with no strings attached. Now, it's pretty rare for anybody to be pure taker or pure giver. Right? You might have taker moments, like when you're negotiating your salary, you're probably thinking mostly about what can I get, and not that interested in giving something back. And when you're mentoring somebody, you probably fall a little bit more into the giving side of the spectrum, and are just trying to help out the person whose success you're hoping to facilitate. But, but my data show, and this has been corroborated by a lot of other researchers, is that most of us, in most of our interactions, are right in the middle of that spectrum, as what I call matchers. And a matcher is basically somebody who tries to keep an even balance of give and take. Quid pro quo, tit for tat, reciprocity. I do you a favor, I want an equal one back. And being a matcher seems to be a pretty safe way to live your life. But is it actually the most effective and productive way to live your life? Is the question that I want to ask tonight. Now I'm going to try to answer it in a little bit, but before we do that, I think we need to dive into the psychology of a taker. And the first place to do that is to say there are at least four of you, by my count, who are takers and don't even know it at this very moment. Now, how would you know? I prepared a short test. You can all take it now. Hopefully, the lighting is clear enough for you to be able to read it. Go.
Now, I hope this is the only thing I will say tonight that does not have data behind it, but I believe this so passionately that I don't need data to say it, which is the longer it takes you to laugh, the more worried I am about your taker score. <laughs> now, I, I show you this cartoon in part because narcissists are one variety of takers, right? People with inflated egos who think that they're superior to others and believe that they have to be better than others in order to be successful. Second variety of takers, more common perhaps, would be those who are former givers and matchers, but learn the hard way that it's dangerous to be too generous. Maybe they got burned or exploited one too many times, and they decided, you know what, it is a dog-eat-dog -dog competitive world. If I don't put myself first, nobody will. There is a third variety of taker that I will not be addressing tonight. It's called a psychopath. <laughs> now, I think more useful than recognizing it in yourself is how do you spot it in others? How do you know if somebody else is a taker? And those of you who are not familiar with this evidence, I was stunned to discover there is actual data showing that you can spot a taker just by looking at a photograph. I've taken for you two photographs of CEOs. I would argue one a taker, the other a giver. And the question is, can you tell from their faces and their clothing which one is the taker? Now, I should say, both of these CEOs built very successful companies. Takers, matchers, and givers can all succeed. They all do, although they have different ways of doing it. Both of these men also got their career starts in a little group in the United States called the Richard Nixon Presidential Administration, one of the world's greatest training grounds for being a taker. And I'm curious, I want to get a vote from all of you about which of these two men you think is the taker, and then I'll ask a few of you to justify your vote. What cues did you rely on to make your judgments? And I will not accept intuition as an answer. I actually want something that you looked at that led you to make a taker judgment. All right, how many people think the man on your right is the taker? How many of you are still trying to figure out which one is your right? Okay. <laughs> This guy, again, show of hands, who, who thinks he's a taker? All right, it looks like we're about half. Okay, so why do you think that man is a taker? Fake smile. Fake smile, how do you know? It doesn't reach his eyes, yes. Some of you will know the French neurologist Duchenne did some wonderful research in the 1800s showing there are these little muscles in the corner of our eyes that produce crow's feet or wrinkles or crinkles when there is an authentic smile, and we cannot control those muscles. So you will see the eyes wrinkle right here when somebody is genuinely feeling joy, but not when they're faking it. Now the problem is, takers and givers alike are all capable of fake and real smiles. And in fact, one of the times that you will catch a taker in a genuine smile is right after that person has just exploited you. <laughs> There's even a term for this in psychology, it's called duping delight. <laughs> it captures the sheer euphoria that only a taker can experience after a successful lie. Um, so it actually doesn't appear in the eyes or the smile. Is there any other cue that led you all to judge that man as the taker? Yes. So the taker is kind of making himself very, very front and center. Yeah, so you see a little bit, this guy is wanting to dominate the image. Okay, very interesting. Any other clues? Yes? His tie very much like his tie says, look at me. How do you see that? Ah. <laughs> uh, a shiny silk tie, look at me, I'm important. Yes. And related to that, how many of you think he's a taker because he's wearing pinstripes? This is the most common answer, by the way, that I've come across. Takers wear pinstripes. Now, in the United States, we associate that with the New York Yankees in baseball. Um, but you could put it also in the same category, right? Of, well, maybe he cares more about his appearance and pinstripes as a way to be flashy, perhaps. All right, so I am sorry to say that this man is, in fact, the giver. And some of you are like, yes. <laughs> And I would like to offer you my sincere and warm congratulations for guessing correctly on a 50-50 shot. <laughs> well done. Uh, no, I think, I think it's really interesting, and I'll, I'll get to those of you who did guess right in a moment. But the man on your right, some of you may have heard of him. His name is John Huntsman Sr. 
Uh, in the United States recently, his son, Huntsman Jr., was a presidential candidate. I chose him as a giver for a couple reasons. One is uh, he's one of 19 people on Earth who have given away over a billion US dollars to charity in their lifetimes. Another is when the financial markets crashed, he couldn't afford to deliver on his charitable commitments, so he took out a personal loan of multiple millions of pounds so he could fulfill his promises and give more money away. If you haven't read his book, Winners Never Cheat, it's a really, really interesting book about what acts of generosity that seem crazy, like giving away maybe 100,000 pounds in a negotiation because you empathize with the CEO sitting across the table from you whose wife has just died from cancer, why that might actually be a smart business practice. But he seems to be a pretty generous guy. On the left, on the other hand, we have the taker. Now, did anybody recognize his face? OK, that would be cheating, sir. <laughs> you are not allowed to use actual information about these people, only their photos and their clothes. But who was he? I think he should be cheated right now. Yes. You recognize the name? Yes. A sinner, Enron, yes. Anybody know his name? <laughs> Kenneth Lay, yes. One of the sinners in the Enron scandal. Now, those of you who were really excited that you were able to spot Lay as a taker, who were you? If you knew that he was the taker. I should tell you at this point that there is nothing in either of these photographs that says anything about givers and takers. <laughs> I just enjoy seeing what people are willing to read into meaningless photographs. <laughs> And you all passed my test, thank you for that. <laughs> now, in, in all seriousness, I show you this photo for two reasons. One is to remind you all that we make snap judgments of who's a giver and who's a taker, right? If you've read Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, you might call this thin slicing. And we have these intuitions, right? These fast impressions formed in a nanosecond of, well, is this person generous? And is this person selfish? And although those judgments are accurate in other domains, like introversion, extroversion, when it comes to give and take, they turn out to do no better than chance because a person's outer veneer is totally different from his or her inner motives. You can be warm and friendly and welcoming and polite and nice on the surface, but be a self-serving bastard on the inside. <laughs> and that's how a lot of people describe Ken Lay, right? He was not just a taker, he was an exceptional faker, i.e. a taker disguised as a giver. He donated 1% of Enron's annual profits to charity to create this aura of being giving. But I think if we had looked more closely at Ken Lay's behaviors, four or five years before the company collapsed, we might have recognized perhaps that he was a taker. One of the patterns we see among takers I call kissing up, kicking down. And it captures the idea that if you're a taker, you're going to be a really good faker when you're dealing with powerful people because you want to impress your superiors. But it is a ton of work to keep up that masquerade in every interaction you have with another person. And if you're a taker, it's not that efficient, it seems, to be generous toward your peers or subordinates when you're really just trying to maximize your own immediate self-interest. So one implication is we shouldn't have asked Ken Lay's bosses if he was a taker or a giver. We should have asked his, his peers and the people who work below him. But I believe if we had paid more attention to some cues that we could have picked up without even meeting him or anyone who knew him, we could have spotted him as a taker circa 1997, four years before Enron collapsed. And we could have done it from a photograph. I just haven't given you the data you needed yet to make the judgment, and for that I sincerely apologize. But let me show you. This is Huntsman's picture from his company's annual report. And the question is, what do you think Ken Lay's looked like? Those of you who said bigger, that would be a dramatic understatement. In 1997, Enron chose to devote an entire page to his head. <laughs> now, lest you think this is an anomaly, I submit to you a few additional cues. Exhibit A. A few pages later, there is a full page photo of Jeff Skilling and another Enron executive. 2000, three years later, a year before the company went under, there are not one but four photos of Ken Lay and four photos of Jeff Skilling in the annual report. Exhibit B, why do I care about these data? Chatterjee and Hamrick did a brilliant study of computer companies, published a few years ago. They got Wall Street analysts who cover all those companies to actually rate the CEOs after meeting them on a taker scale. They rated how egotistical, how selfish, how narcissistic is each CEO. 
And then they looked for clues that correlated with those analyst ratings. And one of the clues, believe it or not, was the prominence of the CEO's photo in the annual report. The CEOs who were rated as takers by analysts who knew them actually had larger photos in the annual report and were more likely to be pictured alone. Which sent a pretty clear signal, right? I am the most important person in this company. It is all about me. Now, there were two other cues that also revealed the taker CEOs. And when you average the size of the photo together with these other two, they correlated 0.86 with the Wall Street analyst ratings, which is a whopping correlation in the social sciences. The question is, what were the other two cues? Anyone know? Beyond the size of the photo, how else would you know that a CEO was a taker? Pay. pay. Yes, relative pay. So the average CEO in the computer industry made two to two and a half times the annual salary of the number two executive in that company. The average taker CEO had an annual salary seven times greater than the number two executive in that company, literally taking more. The third key was in their speech. What two words do takers use more than the rest of us? I and me, especially when talking about the company instead of us and we. So you now know a little bit about how to spot a taker. But what I'm really interested in is how do the takers outside of the corner office, in ordinary jobs, in different kinds of organizations and industries, how do they compare success-wise to the givers and the matchers? And to look at that, I went to three very different worlds, different kinds of jobs with different ways of measuring success, and asked which of these three groups, the takers, the matchers, and the givers, is the worst off? So let me just introduce you to the three places that I looked for these data. Engineers, looking at data, engineers rating each other on how many favors they did versus how many favors they received, which is a great way to get information about whether they tend to be givers, takers, or matchers. And then tracking their productivity objectively and the number of mistakes that they make in their work. Medical students, in that case, looking at their grades throughout all seven years of Belgian medical school, this is every student in medical school in Belgium, and looking at surveys with statements like, I love helping others, as a way of looking at how much they love to give. And then salespeople, my favorite setting, thinking about, okay, let's track their annual revenue, and let's again find out how much they like helping their colleagues and their customers, versus how much do they care about maximizing their own direct personal self-interest. Now, across these three domains and different measures of success, engineering productivity and error rates, medical school grades, sales revenue, there was one group among the takers, the givers, and the matchers that was consistently the worst. And I'd love to get a show of hands on which group you think that was. How many people think that the takers were the worst off? Raise your hands high so we know who you are. We have a few optimists in the room. You will be promptly shipped to the United States where you belong. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Uh, <laughs> This all stems from a 2010 visit to the Google offices in London where we were working on helping uh, Google engineers recognize their strengths. And one of the engineers said, sorry, here in the UK we don't have strengths. <laughs> uh, at, at which point he made a list of all of his weaknesses and agreed that his least, le his least weak weaknesses would count as strengths. So, <laughs> if we must. <laughs> that, that said, all right, so we have a few votes for takers at the bottom, but not many. How many people think the matchers were at the bottom? Okay, now this would be sad news because most people are matchers. And it would suggest, actually, that the majority of people were bad engineers, bad medical students, and bad salespeople. How many people think the givers were at the bottom? Okay, we have a few as well. And those of you who voted givers, you would be right. The worst performers in all three domains were the helpful and generous. In engineering, the engineers with the lowest productivity and the most mistakes were the ones who did more favors than they got in return. They were so busy helping their colleagues that they just ran out of time and energy to get their own work done. In medical school, the students with the worst grades were the ones who agreed most strongly with, I love helping others. Now, if you think about that for a moment, it suggests that the doctors you trust are the ones who never wanted to help anybody. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but the medical students admitted that when it came time to prepare for a big exam, instead of filling the gaps in their own knowledge, they were helping their classmates learn stuff that they themselves already knew. 
And then in sales, Dane Barnes and I found in a study in North Carolina in the US that the worst salespeople were the ones who were passionate about helping their customers. And one salesperson put it really bluntly to me after the study was over. He said, I care so much about my customers that I will never sell them one of our crappy products. <laughs> Thank you for your candor. Uh, now, I thought this was interesting, right? That these people who want to help others do so at the expense of their own success. And for those of you who are givers, I thought this was a tragedy. How many of you would self-identify more as givers than takers or matchers? Show of hands. Okay, and how many of you self-identify as givers, but know that if you raised your hand, you would violate the norm of modesty? <laughs> All right, those are the real givers in this room. Now, I was curious, all right, if the givers are at the bottom, who's most likely to be at the top in these different domains? How many people think it's the takers, who are typically the best engineers, the best medical students, and the best salespeople? Okay. And how many people think it's the matchers? All right, that's a majority. How many of you didn't raise your hands? Thank you for participating. Uh, now, in, in all seriousness, maybe you didn't raise your hands because you already anticipated something that took me 10 years to figure out, which is it was not the takers. It was not the matchers either. It was the givers again. Nope. Yeah, that was my reaction too. How could this be? Well, it actually turned out that the least successful and the most successful, engineers, medical students, and salespeople, were the ones who were helpful and generous. Somehow, the givers at the top managed to help their colleagues and achieve their own goals. They managed to be amazingly productive engineers while supporting problem solving with their coworkers. They managed to get the best grades in medical school while making sure that their friends were prepared for their careers. And they managed actually, on average, the givers to sell 50% more annual revenue than takers and matchers. They started out slower, it turned out. They were listening to their customers, asking them questions, learning about their interests. And sometimes that was at odds with a really aggressive, assertive pitch. But over time, they had two advantages, the givers. One, they built trust, and their customers actually valued their opinions. And two, they learned more about their customers' interests and were able, ultimately, to offer more useful products and services. So, takers and matchers are more likely, in these contexts and several others, to fall right in the middle of the success spectrum. Givers are overrepresented at the bottom and the top. And that really raised for me two questions that motivated me to write this book. The first question is, what do successful givers do that takers and matchers might want to learn? I think this is a really important question because these are not hardwired personality traits. These are choices we make in every interaction we have with another human being. So I, you could take, for example, think of the biggest taker you know, and you could encourage that person to switch a mindset in their next interaction. And instead of saying, what can I get from this person, maybe they'll propose a trade and even exchange and be more of a matcher. Or maybe they'll just offer something and not ask for anything back and act like more of a giver. As we make these choices a little bit differently in each interaction, our styles can change. So if there are things that successful givers do, maybe takers and matchers might want to emulate them. The second question is, what happens to those poor givers at the bottom of these success metrics? And how do you end up avoiding the costs? I want to shed just a little bit of light on those two questions today, if you are ready. I see some nods. I will take that as a definitive and emphatic, <laughs> yes! All right. The way I want to do this for today, uh, I covered in the book a lot of different domains. I looked at how successful givers network, collaborate in teams, how they spot talent, how they develop people below them, how they influence, how they persuade, how they negotiate. What I want to talk about for today is the networking piece. So what do successful givers do as they manage the, the range of contacts that come into their personal and professional lives? And to do that, I turn to Fortune Magazine's best networker. Fortune did this great analysis in 2011, where they used social media, namely LinkedIn. How many of you are on LinkedIn? OK, you are all in this study, whether you gave your consent or not. <laughs> what Fortune did was they took the Fortune list of the most powerful people on Earth, the Fortune 500 CEOs, the Fortune top 50 women in business, Fortune's top 40 in tech under 40, 640 powerful people in total. They cross-referenced that list with the entire LinkedIn database of over 90 million people. And the question was, which LinkedIn members connected to more of those powerful people than any other? The winner had over 3,000 LinkedIn connections. 
including the founders of most of the great tech companies in the last 20 years, including all of these people, also had the former chef of the Grateful Dead in that network. I do not know why you want that person in your network, but I thought it was a really cool fact. <laughs> so I thought this was a great way to figure out, all right, is Fortune's best networker a giver, a taker, a matcher, and what can we learn from that person? And by the way, are those real connections? Or did this person just find a loophole for getting people to say yes to a LinkedIn request? So I was really surprised by the results of this. I'll show you the top three from the Fortune analysis. In third place, this man, Michael Dell, founded a little computer company you may have heard of. Seems like a good candidate to have a strong network of powerful people in technology. In second place was this man, Jeff Weiner, also known as the CEO of LinkedIn, who technically has access to all LinkedIn accounts and <laughs> can connect with anyone he wants, which is unfair. Uh, but actually, technically, LinkedIn employees were excluded from this analysis. But I thought it was interesting that the winner even beat the LinkedIn CEO. So I want to show you a picture of Fortune's best networker. Because I believe in this case, a picture is really worth at least a 1,000 words. And you may be as surprised as I was. Here is, according to Fortune, the best networker on the planet. <laughs> it's the guy, not the cat, by the way. <laughs> Anybody recognize him? You shouldn't recognize him. I didn't. His name is Adam Rifkin. And he violates every stereotype that I know about successful networkers, which made him a really interesting case study. Here are a few data points. Point number one, he is a computer programmer. Networking, computer programming. There's a different kind of networking computer programmers are good at, but social networking? Really? But yeah, he turns out to be extremely shy and quiet and introverted. In fact, so much that in the early 1990s, he was so determined to come out of his shell that he began posting all of his personal information on the internet in the hopes that it would help him become more comfortable opening up in real life. <laughs> he posted a lot of biographical information. He started keeping like a public journal online. He even put up his phone, phone number and his home address, which he would soon come to regret. But as you might have anticipated, he is a huge Star Trek fan. <laughs> and he also loves making anagrams of his own name, rearranging the letters in Adam Rifkin to try to find the perfect way of capturing his identity. He also once counted the number of hours he has wasted in his life typing two spaces after every period instead of one. <laughs> yeah, he actually did the count. So this guy is known as the giant panda of computer programming in Silicon Valley. And the question is, how does a shy, quiet, introverted Star Trek nerd who loves computers and anagrams know more powerful people on LinkedIn than anyone else? To answer that question, I did what's only natural in this connected world that we all live in. I began stalking him. <laughs> First it was internet stalking, then it was telephone, then I went out to watch him in California. And my first question to him was, Adam, how did you build your network? And as he often does, he broke into song. <laughs> it went something like this. He said, well, building my network was really simple. In the end, only. <laughs> no, <laughs> he's saying it worked better than I did. But anyone know the last uh, two words? Yeah. Kindness matters. I am so glad I'm not the only Jewel fan in this room. In the end, only kindness matters. So to add to my list of Adam Rifkin facts is that this man has built his life on a jewel song. Great. <laughs> his, his second comment was, no, seriously, my network has been built through trying to make the people I meet better off. OK, cool. Maybe he's a giver. I want to learn more about it. And he said, let me take you to my natural habitat. This is Adam in his natural habitat. <laughs> He said, you have to understand, if you want to know anything about networking, the difference between a strong tie and a weak tie. Those of you who don't know these labels, strong ties are the people we know well and trust, our closest allies. Weak ties are our acquaintances, the people we barely know. And Adam said, if you need a job or you're looking for advice, most people will go to their strong ties because the strong ties are the people who will be a giver toward you. They're not necessarily givers in all of their relationships, right? But when you've developed deep trust and a meaningful connection with someone, you're willing to help them out with no strings attached. And so, of course, you should go to your strong ties when you need a job because they're going to be there for you. 
And Adam said, but not so fast. He was familiar with research by Mark Granovetter at Stanford, who showed that weak ties are often stronger than strong ties. That on average, people are frequently twice as likely to get a job through a weak tie than a strong tie. How could your acquaintances give you more than your most trusted friends and colleagues? Well, one answer is you just have more weak ties. And so probabilistically, you're more likely to find a job that way. That may be true, but there's a more powerful explanation supported by the data, which is that strong ties tend to give you redundant information. Your most trusted friends and colleagues know a lot of the same people and the same stuff that you do. Chances are they live in the same place or work at the same organization or share some family connections. And so it's hard to find out about new things from those strong ties. Your weak ties, on the other hand, are much more likely to travel in different circles, meet different people, learn different things, and therefore can open the door to new opportunities. So I asked Adam, this is great, how does it work for you? And he said, well, it doesn't. I'm too shy to reach out to my weak ties. <laughs> Why are you telling me this? He said, well, you know, occasionally I will reach out to a weak tie, and you know, if they help me, then I want to be helpful to them, so I will at least match them to not be a taker. And then at some point, you know, we'll get to know each other better through the exchanging of help, and I will accidentally turn that person into a strong tie. And then, according to the research, they're useless to me. <laughs> Why are you telling me this? But Adam actually found a way to get the best of both worlds. The trust, the comfort, the familiarity of a strong tie, and the willingness to give, coupled with the novel information that a weak tie brings. Here's how he did it. This is probably my favorite Adam Rifkin story. 1993, let's go back 20 years. Adam is one of the first people to recognize the social potential of the internet. To realize the internet is not just a vehicle for sharing information, it's also a place where you can build community and help people make connections. And the way that Adam does this, because he loves music, is in his spare time, he starts building fan pages for bands that he really likes. These are often local bands, you know, he goes to a bar or a pub and he sees a band play, and he thinks the band is great, he wants to help them build an audience. So he builds them a little fan page and hopes that people will show up to their site. Now, most of these fan pages went nowhere. But there was one fan page that just took off. It was a punk rock band, according to Adam. And within a month, they had about 100,000 visitors. Six months, I believe, they had over a million visitors. I didn't even know there were a million people on the internet in 1993. But this band just skyrocketed into superstardom. And some of you might have heard of them. They're called Green Day. So Adam Rifkin is one of the people who helped make Green Day famous by building them this great fan web page. And while he was working on this, I think he made two of the biggest mistakes that tend to plague givers. The first one was in 1994, Green Day's manager contacted him and they said, Adam, we love your fan page so much that we want to buy it from you. We, we love the fact that you have all these visitors, you did a great job with the site, and we want to make it our official Green Day website. And Adam thought about it for a little while. And then he said, no, I won't sell it to you. And he just gave it to them for free. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> this, is, this is what drives us crazy about givers, right? Here Adam you know, worked a bunch of hours building this website. He's now got a very successful and somewhat wealthy band that's willing to buy it, and he just gives it away. Why would he do that? Shortly before that, he made what looked like his second mistake, which was he got an email from this guy, Graham Spencer. It was one of those emails that people only sent around 1993. Really angry, you know, think capital letters. And I'm going to paraphrase it, but it basically said, Dear Adam, I've been to your Green Day page, and I think it's stupid. And he said, Green Day is not a punk rock band. It is top 40 or alternative. And I believe you are doing a gross injustice to all of the punk rock fans out there who are going to their dial-up modems and waiting 38 minutes for an internet connection. <laughs> Finally, the internet gets connected. And then they go to the Alta Vista homepage and have to wait another 12 minutes for that to load. And then they type in punk rock and they get your dumb Green Day page. And Adam's like, oh my god, why did I put my home address on the internet? <laughs> so he writes back to Graham and he says, Dear Graham, I'm not familiar with what you're calling punk rock. Could you send me some demos? And Graham sends him that great but lost invention, the cassette tape. Adam listens to a bunch of these cassettes, 
punk rock is really not his cup of tea. But you know what? He takes a couple hours, and he builds fan web pages for those punk rock bands. And he links them to the Green Day page, so that if you are searching for real punk rock and you accidentally find Green Day, you now have a portal to get you right over to real punk rock. Why did he do it? Well, I think often you, know, you could think Adam does stuff like this out of the kindness of his heart. He likes helping people. He likes giving. It took him a few hours, but you know, it was meaningful. I think in this case, he was also experiencing deep, deep terror. Because, <laughs> I mean, obviously, Graham Spencer has his home address. He's going to come to his house and violently attack him. But that never happened. Graham Spencer never looked him up. He never attacked him. And Adam just wasted a bunch of hours making fan pages for a complete stranger with a green mohawk for bands whose music he didn't even like. So these are, I think, the two things that often get givers in trouble, right? He overextended himself for a complete stranger who could do him no good, and he also gave away a, a website that he could have made a lot of money for, for free. And I was thinking about these two stories as Adam told them to me, and I was like, yeah, you know, I just, my heart goes out to these poor givers who help others and then, you know, really suffer for it. And it reminded me of my first ever introduction to givers and takers. Um, this is, I think, the greatest philosopher of our time, who was the first person to ever use this language uh, as I encountered it and really captured how many of us react to givers, if we can get this vintage video footage to work. Huh. Still a 31 waist? Yep, since college. Hey, Lena Small's on this list. Lena Small? Yeah, there's a girl I was gonna call for a date. She was unlisted, and now here's her number. Oh, you're not gonna cop a girl's phone number off an AIDS charity list. Lane, you should admire me. I'm aspiring to date a giving person. But you're a taking person. That's why I should date a giving person. If I date a taking person, everyone's taking, taking, taking. No one's giving. It's bedlam. <laughs> so, George. Yeah. Guess what? Lena found out how I got her number. Really? How'd she do that? You're a friend of a friend of Susan's. My Susan? Why'd you tell her? I had to, Jerry. It's a couple rule. We have to tell each other everything. Well, you know what this means, don't you? What? You're cut off. You're out of the loop. <laughs> you cut, you cut me off? No, 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 Jerry, don't cut me off. You leave me no choice. You're the media now, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, Jerry, come on, please. It won't happen again. If you were in the mafia, would you tell her every time you killed someone? Hey, a hit is a totally different story. I don't know, George. So Lena was upset, huh? You know what? That was the amazing thing. What, it didn't bother her? No, she said it was fine. Hmm. Something very strange about this girl. What? She's too good. Too good. I mean, she's giving and caring and genuinely concerned about the welfare of others. I can't be with someone like that. I see what you mean. I, I do think that captures how a lot of us respond to givers, right? They're do-gooders. They're bleeding hearts. Giving is a sign of weakness. But I believe, and the data in Adam Rifkin's experience show, it can also be a source of strength. Here's how. 1998. Adam decides he's going to move to Silicon Valley, and he's going to start his first company. He doesn't know anybody there, and he knows he needs to connect with some people to get his idea off the ground. So he's racking his brain, and he remembers that Graham Spencer, the punk rock green mohawk guy, might have lived in Silicon Valley five years earlier. So he basically, I mean, he just, this is a total, total shot in the dark. But he looks up the old email, he writes an email to Graham, and he says, Dear Graham, I don't know if you remember me, five years ago, I was the one who built you know, the punk rock pages for the Green Day site. I'm moving up to the Silicon Valley area. If you're still there, would you be willing to meet up for coffee? And lo and behold, Graham is still there. He writes back, and he says, yeah, I'd be happy to meet up. So once Adam makes his move, they sit down for coffee, and Adam is in for three major surprises. The first one is when Graham Spencer walks in, this is Graham Spencer. <laughs> Not exactly your stereotypical punk rock fan. The second surprise is Adam swears that they met for two hours and Graham said about eight words. Graham turns out to be even shyer, quieter, and more introverted than Adam Rifkin. And Adam will tell you that two introverts trying to have a conversation was two of the most awkward hours of his life, which I can relate to as an introvert. 
The third surprise came at the end of the interaction when Graham said, yeah, you know, your company sounds like a neat idea. I'm happy to open some doors if I can. A few weeks later, Adam is pitching his idea to 18 venture capitalists in the Silicon Valley arena, one of whom ends up funding his first company in the range of 30 million pounds. How did this happen? Well, I think this story of Adams with Graham Spencer illustrates four powerful principles that capture how givers succeed as they build their networks. And I want to try to unpack these four for you now. The first one is when I asked Adam, you know, how do you explain this? You know, he said, well, it all comes down, and I thought he was going to give me another bad song, but he said, no, it all comes down to anagrams. I don't know if that's better or worse. But he said, for years, I have been rearranging the letters in my name, and I've come up with classics, like mafia drink. <laughs> but when I look in the mirror, I don't see a mafia drink staring back at me. Nor am I an Inkif drama or a kin aid farm. <laughs> Not that I know what that means. But he said, one day I hit on the perfect anagram. If you rearrange Adam Rifkin right, it actually spells I find karma. <coughs> Ooh. Yes. So Adam said, you know, I got lucky, right? I didn't, I didn't know that Graham was going to be able to do me any good. But Actually, I think it's more than luck. And I think this is the first thing that I learned about successful givers when I started doing this research on networks. How many of you are paranoid? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> but the way that you know if you are paranoid is if when I asked that question, your first reaction was, how does he know? <laughs> so if you are paranoid for non-clinical, non psychiatric reasons, it might be because you are surrounded by takers. Takers cause paranoia in organizations, right? And actually, if you have a lot of takers where you work, there probably are people who are out to get you. But Adam is experiencing the opposite of paranoia. And there's a word for this. If it's not already in your vocabulary, I recommend adding it. It's called pronoia, or the state of being pronoid. What could this mean? Well, my favorite psychologist, Brian Little, who has recently spent some time here in Cambridge, defines pronoia as the delusional belief that other people are plotting your well-being. <laughs> <laughs> Brian will also describe it, if you press him, as this irrepressible fear that other people are going around behind your back and saying exceptionally nice things about you. <laughs> How dare they? So Adam lives in this perpetual state of pronoia, right? He has these people like Graham Spencer, who instead of being out to get him, are out to help him. And he doesn't know why. And he just says it's luck or it's karma. But I believe what Adam calls luck and karma is a predictable and patterned reaction of a certain kind of person to a giver. And those people are called matchers. If you are a matcher, you believe in a just world. You believe that what goes around ought to come around. And that means you cannot stand to see people acting like takers and getting away with it. So matchers among you, when you encounter a taker, your first instinct is to punish that person and make sure that justice is served. Likewise, takers hate to watch givers be generous and not get rewarded for it. And so matchers are often on a mission, right, because they tend to reciprocate or match what other people do. When a giver is generous, a matcher will respond in kind and make sure that that giver benefits from being generous. So I think the first lesson from this story is givers need matchers. Gretchen Rubin said a couple weeks ago, she said, matchers to me are the karma police. They're the people going around and making sure what goes around really comes around. And I think you can see that in Adam's experience with Graham Spencer. By most accounts, Graham is a pretty shy, quiet guy. He doesn't go out of his way to help everyone. He's not a giver in all of his relationships. He seems to be more of a matcher. And because five years earlier, Adam, for no apparent reason, did a really helpful thing for him, Graham feels like, you know what, this is a good guy, and he deserves to get rewarded. So he sticks out his neck, he opens up his network of venture capitalists, and he helps get this 30 plus million pounds of funding for Adam Rifkin. So givers need matchers to succeed. That's the first takeaway here. And by the way, most people are matchers. So if you are a giver, that's a lot of people, most people, to go around plotting your well-being. The easiest way to do that, it turns out, is through gossip. 
a particular kind of gossip that the sociologist Rob Willer calls pro-social gossip, also known as positive gossip, which I think is a great concept. And the idea is, right, you can actually contribute to other people if you're a matcher by warning them about takers, saying don't trust this person, and also by giving them positive reputational data about givers, saying, you know what, this person is helpful and generous, and I think you want this person in your life. And that's basically what happened between Graham and Adam. Second takeaway from this story, beyond givers needing matchers, is if you look at what kind of relationship Adam had with Graham Spencer, Graham is definitely not a strong tie. They've hardly even met. But he's also not a weak tie, because five years earlier, they had a meaningful exchange. He has a third kind of tie that researchers call a dormant tie. A dormant tie is somebody you used to know, but lost touch with in the last couple of years. And there are amazing studies on this by Daniel Levin that have just been published with a few colleagues. And what the studies show is if you really need advice or information or a job, you will often get better help and better knowledge if you reconnect with a dormant tie than if you reach out to one of your current ties. Why? It's pretty simple. Dormant ties give you the best of both worlds. On one hand, they give you the, the trust, the familiarity, and the comfort that you get from a strong tie. It's much easier to reach out to a dormant tie than a weak tie, right? If you used to know somebody, you have some shared experience, some meaningful history, and it's faster and easier to, to go and say, hey, I'd love to catch up with that person than it is a pure acquaintance that you don't know at all. And you can also count on that person, right, because you have this shared experience to maybe understand your perspective and, and want to help you out a little bit. Whereas the other side of this picture is if you look at also the other benefit, the strong ties tend to have redundant knowledge. Dormant ties have been meeting different people and learning different stuff in the past few years since you last talked. And so that's a great opportunity not only to have these people that you have some trust with, but also get efficient access to new information from. And I think you can see this really clearly in Adam's experience with Graham. Because in 1993, Graham was just a college student studying computer science. But in 1998, shortly before they reconnected, Graham sold a little company called Excite to the At Home Network for 6.7 billion US dollars <laughs> as the majority founder. Now, if Adam had reached out to Graham in 1993 as a college student, Graham wouldn't have been able to help him. But after this very successful launch of a tech company, Five years later, he had an amazing network of venture capitalists. And at that point, right, the dormant tie had a lot of value. Now, the good news is also, Levin and colleagues show that dormant ties become more valuable as you get older. Dormant ties are more useful in your 30s than your 20s, your 40s than your 30s, your 50s than your 40s, partially because you accumulate more of them, but also because there's more time for them to meet new people and learn new things. And so they can add a lot of value to you. So I think the dormant ties are the hidden value in our networks. But it's hard to access this value if you're not a giver. Takers have a pretty hard time reconnecting, right? If somebody has taken advantage of you or been selfish, <laughs> you're going to immediately like, lock the door to your network and say, no, you are not welcome back in my life when the taker reaches out. In fact, there's data su to suggest that takers have ever-expanding networks of acquaintances because after they exploit you, they have to add new people to their network so they can exploit them too. Matchers have an easier time reconnecting, but often run into a couple of challenges. One is that matchers love having a zero balance sheet. No credits, no debits, evening the score. And so things are already even by the time that they reconnect. There's not a lot of goodwill that's, that's waiting to be capitalized on. In addition, I think matchers tend to build narrower and shallower networks than givers do. The narrow part is really simple. It comes from the fact that if you are a matcher, you will only help the people that you think can help you back. Because after all, the whole point of being a matcher is if you're going to do something for someone, you should get an equal return. So if you were a matcher, you never would have helped Graham Spencer when you got that email and you thought he was a green mohawk punk rock fan, because what can that guy ever do for me? And I'm going to help him, and it's not going to be even. Whereas givers are much more likely to help more indiscriminately, right? And some of those people that you helped that you didn't think could help you back turn out to achieve amazing things. The, broad, uh, sorry, the deeper network part comes from matchers be often being transactional, leaving an instrumental feeling like, you know, I didn't really care about you. I was just offering you something to get something back, and this was an economic or a financial exchange. As opposed to when a giver tends to exchange help with someone, it's an investment in a meaningful relationship. Right? It's a sign that I care about you and your well-being. 
So givers have a ton of benefits to gain from reconnecting with people they used to know, right? Who think they're generous, who appreciate their contributions. This brings us to the third point. You can only access those benefits if you are willing to ask for help. And this is something that all, a lot of givers struggle with. When I look at the research on this, the biggest problem that givers run into is refusing to be on the receiving end of an exchange. Feeling like I always have to be the one helping and contributing and supporting others. And yet, if you don't ever ask for help, that's a great recipe for burnout and a great recipe for being taken advantage of. So I find consistently the givers who succeed are the ones who put others first most of the time, but also are willing when they really need it to go and reach out to their networks and say, here's what I'm looking for, would you be willing to help me? And guess what? One way you could frame this if you're a giver is to say, well, if I don't ever ask for help, then I am depriving the other people in my life of the opportunity to be givers. <laughs> and how dare I do that to them? But I, I think it's really interesting. You can see that with Adam's story, right? He never would have gotten his first company funded if he hadn't been willing to ask Graham Spencer for help. Not only that, that led to the funding of his second startup, his third startup, his ability to retire while he was still in his 30s, and then to found an amazing nonprofit called 106 Miles that meets in uh, two different California cities. And it's a network of over 5,000 entrepreneurs who meet twice a month to help each other. And Adam's basically there to support entrepreneurs and make them as successful as he can. All of that enabled by being a giver and then being willing to ask when he really needed help. Fourth and final principle that I would take away from this story. Go back to the help that Adam provided to Graham Spencer. He did not spend 10,000 hours going out of his way to change Graham Spencer's life. A lot of people think that being a giver requires being a Gandhi or a Mother Teresa. And I think that's really debilitating. Right? We think about those exemplars, we can never achieve it, why should we bother helping? Adam argues that what we should do if we want to be more effective givers is just add a few five minute favors to our days. And he says, look, there are a lot of ways you can add a lot of value to other people's lives at a low cost to you. Adam's two favorite ways of doing this are making introductions and writing recommendations. So frequently, he goes out of his way to find two people that he thinks would benefit from knowing each other writes a little email introducing them and saying, here's why I think you guys should connect, and then he just gets out of the way. And it's a great example, right? It only takes him five minutes, but he's helping these people a lot. He's found dozens and dozens of entrepreneurs, co-founders for their companies. If they're business people, a technology partner and vice versa. The second way that, that he likes to give, which also takes him five minutes, is writing recommendations. And when somebody does something really generous or goes the extra mile, he'll just write a quick email to their boss saying, you know, this person was really helpful and here's why. Trying to recognize and acknowledge the givers around him. So I love this idea of, of doing more five minute favors. And I think it makes giving palatable. But there's a twist, which is, if you met Adam and he did a five minute favor for you, a few months later, he will probably reach out to you and ask you for help. And this happens often enough that you're like, wait a minute, is he just a clever matcher in disguise? who gives first and then waits long enough so it seems like he's a giver, and then he swoops in to make his ask. And you're like, gotcha. But no, because he adds a wrinkle. He doesn't ask you to help him. He asks you to help him help the other people in his network. So he will reach out to you and say, hey, I'm trying to help this person find a job. Would you be willing to support those efforts? And do you know any contacts at these companies? And I think what Adam's trying to do is get everybody in his network to pay it forward and do five minute favors. And he believes, and there's a lot of data that I cover in chapter two to support this, that if you do that, you will experience two benefits. First one is, it's a lot less dangerous to be a giver if everybody in your network is also a giver. You don't have to worry about being exploited by takers. Second benefit is, if everybody in your network is a giver, when you need help, you can go to anybody, the person who's best suited to help you, as opposed to what most of us do as matchers, which is only go to the people we know well and trust which are not always the people with the expertise and the connections to support us. So Adam is basically investing in turning other people into givers. And when I went to, to watch him in action, I met over 90 people, all of whom had different versions of the same story, which was, you know, I used to basically try to exchange favors evenly. After meeting Adam, I wanted to pay it back to him because I was so grateful for his help. He wouldn't let me. And the next best thing I could do was pay it forward. And now I kind of feel like it's even. And he started this whole chain of pay it forward exchanges, which is very cool. So those are four things you can take away from Adam's story about what successful givers do as they build networks. For those who are curious, just a taste of some other things that are in give and take if you go further. 
Collaboration. How do you manage the dynamics of giving and taking credit in a team? How do you decide who gets to do the interesting, meaningful, visible projects? And who gets stuck with the grunt work that no one will ever see? And why did this man, who's known as the genius of all geniuses behind the greatest TV show in television history, toil for years in anonymity? Would he been, have been better off claiming more credit and walking into the spotlight? Like, for example, the architect Frank Lloyd Wright, who forced his apprentices to sign his name first on all of their architectural documents, even if he had no involvement in them, otherwise he would accuse them of forgery. Is it better to be a giver, a taker, or a matcher in a team, and how do you manage that? Leadership. Those of you, how many of you have read Good to Great by Jim Collins? All right, so those who have, you'll remember Jim saying one of the most important decisions a leader makes is to get the right people on the bus. And that would suggest that maybe leaders should try to hire givers, because givers tend to add a tremendous amount of value to organizations. But Jim said something more important that often gets overlooked, which is you have to keep the wrong people off the bus. It's actually more critical to screen out takers than it is to hire givers, because a bad apple can spoil the barrel much more easily than a giver basically can improve it. So I look at how do you actually judge other people? How do you assess who's a taker, who's a giver, and who's likely to be a star? And one of the questions that I love in this chapter is how did this man, CJ Skender, an accounting professor, spot talent as a giver in ways that takers and matchers never saw it? How did he know that this woman, Beth Trainum, whose own mother told her she couldn't add or tell time, would one day win a national accounting medal? Also, how did he know that this guy, Reggie Love, written off by many as just an athlete, would one day become the body man to President Obama? And what do givers know about recognizing talent that we might want to learn? Decision making. For those of you who follow sports, why do some people pass up the opportunity to draft great players, like Michael Jordan, and then when they get stuck with one of the greatest draft busts in basketball history, why do they hang on to him for four or five years before finally letting him go? What causes people to fall into the trap that psychologists call escalation of commitment to a losing course of action? And is it the givers, the takers, and the matchers who are most vulnerable to over-investing in people? It could be the matchers. I'll leave it to you to guess. But what I think is really interesting here is the question of how do you get people to make better choices, whether it's you or someone you care about, when they are invested in somebody who's not panning out? And how do you get them to follow the advice of my favorite motivational poster? <laughs> I apologize if that hits too close to home for anyone in this room. <laughs> Always worry about that. And then, how do you manage the cost of giving? Burnout, of course, being one of the most common. <laughs> how is it that a, a teacher named Connery Callahan can experience some of the worst burnout you can imagine in a service profession, and yet go on to win multiple teaching awards and discover that she could reduce her burnout, not by giving less, but giving more? Why is giving exhausting for some, but energizing for others? What makes the difference between whether givers are burned out or fired up? And then also, how do you deal with takers? How do you make sure you don't become a doormat or a pushover? How do you negotiate and make decisions and hold takers accountable? But my favorite question, perhaps, is this one. Can you turn a taker into a giver? I don't know. I think it's hard. I think, though, that we all have giver moments. And I illustrated this recently with a colleague who said, I know a huge taker who happened to be a father. And I said, all right, go watch this person at home and watch for the next time that their son or daughter says, you know, I really need you to drive me to school. And wait for the father to say, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> Pretty rare, right? We all have roles and relationships where we act more giving. If we can understand the triggers, I think we can nudge people ever so slightly in the giver direction. My favorite way to do that is an exercise that I recommend to every person in this room. It's called the reciprocity ring, invented by Wayne Baker at the University of Michigan and Cheryl Baker at Humax Networks. What you do is you gather a group of people together and you invite them all to think about a request that they want to make, something meaningful to ask for, that they want in their professional or personal lives, but cannot get on their own. And then the rest of the group acts like givers. 
and their job is to try to fulfill the request and make it happen. So it's pretty cool to see it in action. I'll just show you a couple sample requests so you can get a flavor for it. Uh, Wayne Baker, when he started running this, had a biopharmaceutical executive who said, I have to pay a boatload of money to synthesize a strain of the PCS alkaloid, and I can't afford that in my budget. Can anybody do it cheaper? And a complete stranger from a competing biopharmaceutical company raised a hand and said, actually, I have some slack capacity in my lab. This sounds like a good stretch or development project for my team, and went and did it for free. Saving a good chunk of money on this spot. And I think it's, it's pretty neat when that happens. My favorite request, though, was from a student who came in and said, I'm looking for a job, but this is sort of an unconventional job search. I think the closest thing to nirvana in life is riding a roller coaster. This is, I guess, a uniquely American thing. And he said, I really want to run an amusement park one day. But strangely, Six Flags does not recruit at the Wharton School of Business. So could anybody help me break into that industry? And basically, what, what Alex ended up doing was, uh, was asking around. And one of the students in the room, Andrew, raised his hand and said, yeah, actually, I think my dad knows the former CEO of Six Flags. Let me see if I can get you in touch. A couple of weeks later, they connect by cell phone. Alex comes into class the next day. I am so excited. Alex, tell me about the conversation. He says, well, it was great. We talked for an hour. I learned a ton about the industry, so much that I now know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I will never, ever want to work there. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, OK, at least you're able to rule that out. So now you can go on to pursue other dreams. And I'm proud to report that today, Alex is living one of those dreams, happily employed as a management consultant. <laughs> But I think the reciprocity ring is a great way of, of getting people to act like givers. Number one, it makes helping visible. And guess what? Takers do not take when you shine a spotlight on them. Because they know when, when they make their ask, if they haven't helped other people and volunteered support, then nobody's going to want to help them. Number two, it allows, because everybody is acting like a giver, right? you can go to the person in the room who's best suited to support you, as opposed to that person you know. And then number three, it also empowers everybody to ask. A lot of people find asking uncomfortable. They think it makes them too vulnerable. But here, everybody's making a request. And so it's a lot easier to ask and experience the benefits then of allowing people to both seek and provide help. So if you haven't tried it out, it's a pretty cool exercise. I'll give more details in chapter eight. All right, with that, I want to move it into a breakout and then Q&A. So for the breakout, you have a choice of three topics. And I'll give you a few minutes to, to discuss with people near you. Topic one is reconnecting with dormant ties. If you were going to reactivate an old connection in your network, somebody you lost touch with, who would you re reach out to? How would you go about rekindling that relationship? What would you say to them? And why did you pick them? Um, I've probably taken this to an inappropriate extreme. I have a repeating reminder in my calendar once a month to reactivate one dormant tie. I find it to be really fun and meaningful in addition to all the, the benefits the research supports. So that's your first choice, is if you were going to reconnect with a dormant tie, who would it be? How would you do it? Why would you do it? Second choice is to think about running a reciprocity ring with a group of people that you know. And think about who would you bring together to ask, basically, for requests. And how would you decide who goes in that room? How would you set up the event? And then the third possibility is to think about the biggest taker you know who makes your life most miserable and ask, OK, how can I turn this person into more of a giver <laughs> if possible? So those are your three choices. Think about either reconnecting with a dormant tie, starting a reciprocity ring, or converting a taker. And I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about that, discuss it with anyone you like near you, and then we'll move into Q&A. You can start whenever you're ready. Lots of interesting pieces of discussions, or at least as much as I could hear from one word at a time per pair. 
Um, so at this point, we're going to open it up for questions. If you have comments or reflections from whatever you began discussing in the breakout, those are fair game too. I'm happy to try to answer anything that's on your mind uh, with no guarantee that I can actually answer it. Um, we're going to take about 20 minutes for Q&A and anything you want to raise, and then we'll turn it over to book signing, and I have a couple of closing remarks that I will make. So questions? Right over there, yes. Yeah, Lydia, that's you. Hi, I'm Lydia Khan, and um, I had the pleasure of hearing you in California last week at the Compassion in Business Conference. And <laughs> Actually, I'm stalking her, so. <laughs> I, I live here. So um, what I wanted to ask you is, do you think with all of this conversation about behavior, morals, and values, that we might be at a tipping point, groundswell, or some kind of an awareness and change of different behavior? Yeah, I, I don't know, to be honest. I, I hope so. I think that you know, I've, I've certainly heard a lot more discussion about things that I would put in the giver values category, you know, whether you take conscious capitalism, corporate volunteering, corporate social responsibility, the environmental sustainability movement, right? All of these things, I, I think, are, are activities and practices that, that givers often buy into. Um, are we at a tipping point? I don't know. How will we know? I think one way to know is a dramatic reduction in corporate scandals, which would suggest a minimization of, of the amount of taking that's occurring. Uh, but even then, right, most of those, uh, if you look at Dan Ariely's research, most of those are perpetrated by a very few, you know, v extreme takers. And, you know, I'm not sure then if that would even be a signal. So I guess I, I would wonder, and this is an interesting question to, to think about, and maybe somebody will write a book on it, um, is how would you know when we've reached a tipping point? And how do you actually track whether people are moving more in the giving direction? Because this is hard to measure. Right? We, can, we can get people to respond to surveys, we can get other people to rate you, we can, you know, in some cases, track philanthropy and volunteering rates, um, but at what point will we really know if people are being more helpful and more generous? I don't have a good way to, to assess that, and that really bothers me as a social scientist. Um, but intuitively, I think, yeah, I think there's increasingly enthusiasm about these topics, and I take that as an encouraging sign in a cautiously optimistic way. Next victim. Yes. <laughs> Right over in front of you. There we go. Yes. Either way. We'll, we'll get the microphone taker. Um, thank you. So um, I, uh, I'm going to ask a taking question, I think. Um, if you're in a networking situation and you've got a, a sort of howlingly obvious need and there's certain people in the room that you want to connect with, how do you build trust? Um, sincere. <laughs> hmm. now you could ask a couple hundred people that question right now. If you're very, actually, that would be one way to start. Uh, the, I cover in chapter five uh, this idea that if, if you want to connect with someone, one of the best things you can do is ask their advice on a question like this. Uh, this is Katie Lillianquist's research, and I, I think it's fascinating. What she shows is if you go to someone and ask for their advice, three things will typically happen. One, you flatter them. Uh, ben Franklin, I'm going to paraphrase this, once said that we all admire the wisdom of people who come to us for advice. <laughs> they have incredible taste, right? They know exactly where to go. And you know, I think that that's the first step. The second is, in order for somebody to give you advice, they have to walk in your shoes. They have to look at the problem from your vantage point, which means learning more about you. Right? And with that will typically come some identification and maybe some empathy. You put all that together, right? they're feeling good about you, they understand where you're coming from, and they're much more likely then to step up and help you and advocate. So I would say pose that question to everybody you want to network with and then see if they then become your champion. The other thing I would say is, I think, I don't know, I, I, I quote a couple of networking gurus in the, the networking chapter, one of whom is Keith Ferrazzi. How many people have read Never Eat Alone? So if, if you haven't read it, uh, there's, there's a really good story that was done online. If you just Google Keith Ferrazzi Never Eat Alone, you'll get it. And one of his recommendations is it's really hard to build a meaningful connection when you're at a networking event because networking is like the slick, sleazy, schmoozing taker behavior. And you actually want to make a genuine connection, but you don't have a lot of opportunity or time with other people. And so what he recommends is basically to approach someone and say, I know this is not the time and place. I would really love to have a five minute conversation with you or a 10 or a 20, whatever your ask is. Would you, know, would you be willing to, to set up a phone call or, or meet up next time we're in the same city? And then basically exchange contact details and hopefully you've, you've kicked the door open a little bit, then to build a connection out of this awkward force setting. I think that's the best advice I've heard. 
Yes, right here. What? Microphone coming. Thank you. Thank you. What uh, cultural factors did you take into account? I'm very conscious that you mentioned um, Google in London, but for all I know, 90% of those people you spoke to were Americans, yes. for example. So that's the, that's the question. What, yep. human, what cultural factors did you take into account in your research to produce this book? Good. So I should confess I hail from the land of cultural ignorance, <laughs> and that makes it very difficult for me to answer that question. Uh, f f for that reason, I rely on, on cross-cultural researchers who know much more about this topic than I do. And there are a couple of data points that, that I found really interesting here. Um, I opened the book with some research by Alan Fisk, uh, a, a cultural anthropologist who has studied patterns of interaction across the world's major cultures. And he shows that giving, taking, and matching are actually three fundamental styles of interaction that you can find in every human culture on the planet. His most extreme case is the African Maasai. Has anybody ever lived with the Maasai? I hope not, because very few people ever have. But what um, those of you who, who haven't will maybe know about them is they're a very remote tribe in Western Africa. And Fisk went there to try to figure out, okay, if we go to somewhere completely non-Westernized and industrialized, what can we learn about them? And he found the same types of giving, taking, and matching. So they actually had different models for when you would be a giver, taker, a matcher. When it came to land use, the Maasai were, were unequivocally givers. If you move to their village, they will just give you land for free and ask you for nothing back. They just believe that everybody's entitled to receiving land. But if you go to the marketplace, they will have much more of a taking mindset. And everybody will haggle and bargain for the best price, irrespective of what's good for the, the person at the other end of the table. And then when it comes to cooking meals, they actually are all matchers. And everybody is required to bring an equal share of the portions that they bring so that nobody is giving more than anybody else. So you look at research like that and you say, OK, these models are universal. But where people apply them and how they apply them, there are tons and tons of cultural differences. Um, I, I get into some of them in the book. There, there are a bunch, actually, that my editor cut, I think, rightfully, because they're really complicated and very, very country specific. But what you find pretty consistently is um, very different norms about when it's appropriate to be a giver, a taker, or a matcher, and when it's dangerous from one organizational culture and one national culture to a next. Um, if anybody's interested, uh, shoot me an email or come find me afterward. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about what I've read. Um, but I did my best to, to cover west and east, north and south, and make sure that we weren't over-representing just one country or culture. But admittedly, you know, the data are more westernized than I would like, given where a lot of this research has been done. Yes, right here, if we can get a microphone up this way. Thank you. Hi. Do you have any top tips on how to avoid giver burnout? Chapter you six. Share with us. <laughs> Read chapter six. Everything I know is in that chapter. No, uh, I think, actually, that is true. But <laughs> <laughs> there, there are a couple of things that I think I was really struck by that I've tried to apply to my own life. Uh, one is Leslie Perlow's research on boundaries has really struck a chord with me. So she studied uh, Fortune 500 companies, engineers in India and the US. And what she showed was they were constantly interrupting each other for help and they were all trying to give and they couldn't get their own work done. They were trying to launch a laser printer, they were way behind schedule. And she worked with them to set a quiet time boundary where Tuesday, Thursday and Friday mornings from 9 a.m. to noon, there were no interruptions. And that it seemed would allow them right, to get their own work done and make progress and then you know, the rest of the time they could be busy helping each other and, and interactively problem solving. 66% of the engineers uh, when quiet time was implemented achieved above average productivity and they ended up launching the project on time for the second time in the division's history. And I think there's something really powerful to that idea of saying look I'm going to separate the time that I spend getting my own work done from the time that I spend helping others. And if I actually block out work time in my calendar, it's much less likely then that I will burn myself out with just constant giving. Um, so that's one thing I've, I've personally tried to do after reading this research. My second favorite thing is looking at, uh, at research. Uh, this is Sonia Luba Mirsky and her colleagues. What they look at is, OK, for giving to energize, is it better to do, if you were going to do five random acts of kindness this week, is it better to do all five in one day or better to do one per day for five days? And I was sure that it was going to be spread them out, so you feel like you're making a little bit of a difference each day. But Sonia found the opposite, that you only get happier if you do all five acts of giving on one day. 
that this is, this is sort of puzzling. So guess what? You get to be a giver one day of the week, and then the rest of the time, screw everyone else. <laughs> but it, it, I've, I've actually, again, I've, I found it really interesting to try to put this into action, which is you do one act a day, and it doesn't feel like you're making much of a contribution. And I find over and over again that givers don't just burn out from giving. They burn out from giving when they don't feel like they're having an impact. If you stack up several acts of giving together in one day, you feel a much greater cumulative impact, right? You feel like you are making a real appreciable difference. And so I think that's the second thing to think about, right? Take your acts of giving, put them together so they add up to something of meaning and substance. And then, you know, as you move through the day and the week, you start to feel like, gosh, my, my efforts are really rewarding. And you get energized by that experience and hopefully it carries you through. There are, uh, there are a few other principles in chapter six, but those are a couple of favorites off the top of my head. Uh, let's see, where is our microphone currently? Yes, there. We'll try to work in a more circular fashion. Hi there. Uh, your, th your third question that you asked for the breakout was uh, how, do you, how do you change um, a taker into a giver? Um, we, I think we struggled. Um, can, you, can you explain um, how you do that? Initial thought would get in there into their perspective, but then we wondered, were you then just helping them become even more of a taker? Yes. I think that's usually what happens. So I think the first thing you have to know is, is why is this person a taker, right? If they're the psychopath variety, good luck. Um, you know, I mean, I th seriously, I think, you know, if, there, if there's just a serious deficit of empathy, then I think it's going to be really hard. I think that if, you know, if they're the kind of person who used to be more giving or matching, but learn, you know, it was dangerous to do that, I think your job is basically to show them the rewards, not only the dangers. And that's frankly part of why I wrote the book, right? To, to get people who had found, you know, I can be this way at home, but it's just not safe to do at work, to say, wait a minute, maybe I was wrong about that, and maybe I was just using the wrong strategies as a giver. So maybe trying to open their eyes to that evidence. I think if they're the narcissistic takers, one of the things you might have to do is flatter them a little bit, um, but do that in such a way that you ask them to pay it back or pay it forward. And so you know, hopefully what you do is you get the narcissistic takers to basically build up their egos on the basis of how generous and helpful they are, um, and being way more helpful than anyone else. Uh, which, which I think is obviously dangerous. But if you look at the, the data on this across sort of the, the two varieties of takers that I think you can nudge or shift just a little bit, uh, probably my two favorite principles, one is the advice-seeking idea. So if you have a taker and you want them to be helpful, I would actually go to that person and say, you know, I'm trying to get somebody to help me in a situation like this. Or I'm trying to get someone like you to engage in this kind of behavior, and I'm finding it really hard. What would you do if you were me? And then you can basically, if you start the conversation right, get the taker to walk you through a recipe for how to motivate that person to be a giver. Um, the second approach is, and I think this is the most powerful one, is identification. So takers feel like giving is taking when they bond with another person or a group. So if they become really attached, for example, to a company, then they feel like, well, the more I give to this company, the more I am advancing my own interests too, because if this company succeeds and I'm deeply connected and identified, then I am succeeding too by helping this, this particular organization. So I would think about in a broader sense, right? What are the ways that I can strengthen the attachment between the taker and either the person or the group that I want them to help? Because at that point, there's less of a conflict between self-interest and group interests, and those, those interests become much more aligned. Um, for more details, check out chapter eight. <laughs> Let's send the microphone over this way. Thanks. So you've got, Adam, a team of 11 people. and you're trying I do. Yeah. You okay. Do. I did not know that. Go on. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Imagine. You, All right. Um, I'm with you. So you've got a team of 11. <laughs> you're trying to optimize performance. What balance would you have between givers, takers, mm. matchers? By numbers, please. <laughs> At least there any room for takers. Yeah, that's, I, I love that question. So I'm waiting for that study to be done. I think the composition of what's the right balance of givers, takers, and matchers in a team is one of the next great directions for this uh, stream of research. I, I haven't seen any good data that really speak to it yet. I would certainly say I'd probably want a mix of givers and matchers at minimum. I don't know how many. Um, I think that one of the risks that you have if you get a whole group of just givers together is that they will often just all try to give. And you know, the worst case is they all burn out, right? Because they're too busy helping each other. Nobody makes progress. Uh, the best case is it's just really awkward where you're saying, no, I'm going to help you. No, 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 let me help you. And you can just never negotiate what's a, what's a fair sort of agreement. But I think that what the matchers will buy you is some balance and fairness. And also probably a little bit more toughness and tenacity, right, when you have to, to really hold other people accountable, as opposed to, you know, maybe being a little bit more forgiving or a little bit more trusting. 
Do you ever want a taker? I don't know. Um, I think that if you have a really loyal taker who's committed to your goals and shares your goals, that person can be a great resource, right? And will be, you know, the kind of, of shark or lion or choose your favorite aggressive animal that, you know, you sometimes need to advocate for your own interests, you know, like in a short-term one-shot negotiation, for example. But what I worry about is can you trust that taker to stay aligned with your interests? And I think I'd rather have, right, just a disagreeable giver or a really tough matcher sort of supporting me. Exact numbers, I would be overstepping the data to give you them, but I look forward to seeing the results of that study and maybe you will help me do it. <laughs> uh, yes, over in the back. Hi there, um, I'm Rob. Um, I regularly get asked by my customers if we can offer our service for free. In fact, today I spoke to a, um, a magician, a TV magician, who asked if we could work with him. And it's a common problem that we have. What advice would you give? So customers ask you to work for free. Yes. That's the problem. Yeah, I, I think I, I would probably say a couple of things. Uh, the first one is I would clearly delineate what you're willing to do for free and what you're not on the basis of how much it costs you. Right? So if it's a small request, then I think it's a lot easier to say yes. I think also if you anticipate major benefits right, of, of building the connection, then you know, it's easier to sort of frame that as appropriate matching. Second thing I would say is I think it's, it's really different to think about being a giver as a person versus as a company. And I, I've never seen any data that it's a good idea for a company to just be completely giving, right? When I think about the benefits of being a giver individually, it's about helping other people, not necessarily just giving away your services for free. Uh, I, I think the Adam Rifkin experience is an interesting one, and there are probably others like it. Uh, but I don't know that it's the norm, and I would be, I'd be really interested in seeing what the evidence looks like. So with that in mind, what I would try to do is basically highlight how, and maybe do this proactively as opposed to reactively, how you know, you've been asked so many times for free things that you are jeopardizing or calling into question your ability to continue giving and providing your services. And in order to sustain your ability to provide those services, here are the rates that you need to charge, and here are the conditions under which you're, you're willing and able to make an exception. I think you clarify that policy up front, and people are much more understanding of, oh, you know, just like on an airplane, right, you're supposed to secure your oxygen mask before helping others. I think a company needs to do the same thing. And I think the more clear you can be with that, uh, be with your customers about that, probably the better. But I think it's much easier to manage preemptively than it is to say, oh, we got this request, we don't have a policy, let's try to evaluate this one ad hoc. Happy to talk further, but that was my gut reaction. At the top, yes. Thank you. Sorry. You've been neglected. Fire away. Yes, I'll repeat your question. Just a question. When you look at those videos for groups and you look at their external behavior, do you find any correlation with levels of self awareness or neuroses being different, or they sort of like are they givers that are actually takers? Yeah. Absolutely. Could everyone hear the question? All right. So the question is, how does self-awareness relate to giving, taking, and matching? Is one group more self-aware, or are they completely independent? Um, in general, what I find is mostly independent, with uh, givers tending to be slightly more self-aware. Uh, part of that being, givers tend to be more interested in other people's ideas and opinions, which means more feedback comes in, and they're also more willing to hear it. Um, on the other hand, though, you find a lot of givers who are too hard on themselves, and you know, they have really high standards for what they want to contribute to others, and so they will often, sort of the opposite of a taker, right? The, the praise will just sort of fall off of them, and they internalize all of the criticism and negative feedback. But mostly independent, and one of the reasons why, in chapter three I cover this, uh, this really fun body of research that was started by Mike Ross, and he did something that no psychologist should ever do, which is he took um, romantic partners and put them in separate rooms, and then ask them to estimate the percentage of the total work that goes into their relationship that they personally did. <laughs> and then he added up the, like, you know, the husband and the wife, or you know, one partner and the other's estimates, and three out of every four couples added up to over 100%. <laughs> Mostly the men, I think, were the guilty parties. But what was really interesting was why did people, you know, somebody's overestimating their giving there. And why does that happen? A lot of people think it's because, well, we want to flatter ourselves and we're trying to paint ourselves in the most positive light. And so, you know, we, we're kind of motivated, right, to say, oh, I'm a giver and that person's less of a giver. But Ross and his colleagues found support for a different explanation, which is less about motivation and more about information discrepancy. That in your marriage or in your relationship, 
you literally know more about your own contributions than other people's because you were there. You were there when you took out the trash. You were there when you walked the dog. You were there when you drove the kids to school. You were there when you worked staying up all night on a team project. And by definition also, you were not present for all of your partners and your teammates' contributions. And so I think one of the first steps to self-awareness, whether you're a taker or a matcher or a giver, is actually to learn about what other people have contributed before you make your own judgments of where you stand. Uh, on the Give and Take website, for those who are interested, there's a self-assessment where you can rate yourself on whether you think like a taker, a giver, or a matcher, but you all know too much now, and you're gonna be really biased even more than usual. More fun is the 360 assessment, where you can have the site send an email to anyone who knows you to rate you anonymously. Try that one at your own risk. <laughs> uh, but I think it's a neat way to hold up a mirror and get a sense, right, of do other people see me as a giver, taker, or a matcher? And I think it ultimately is in the eye of the beholder. Let us take one more question as a group. Yes, another one up here. Um, it's the gender question. Ah, the gender question. So, the economic crisis and all the problems we've had and shred the shred and we may have heard of. Um, Nothing against the Royal Bank of Scotland. What seems to have been any different? I know it's accounted for in a sense by the disproportion between males and females at the top of organisation. But would it have made any great difference if females had been at the head of these organizations as opposed to males? Wow. Did everyone hear that one? <laughs> would it have made a difference in corporate scandals if we had more women running organizations as opposed to men? Um, to answer that question, I would like you all to lean in. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I, I've been waiting to do that for like a month. So. <laughs> Uh, no, I think, I think it's, a, it's a really important question. Um, let me say a couple things on that. The first one is there are other, um, other books and other perspectives that have addressed this much more carefully and systematically than I have. And I would defer in particular to two. One is the Athena Doctrine that just came out, uh, which is about basically the future of organizations that are run by women as opposed to men. It was a really interesting read. The other is uh, one of my all-time favorite books, Demonic Males by Richard Wrangham who reviews basically all of the evidence across all animal species, uh, suggesting that almost all of the bad things in the world are perpetrated by men. Uh, if you are not a feminist, after reading that book, you will be one, I promise. Uh, I was converted in college. And I think that I think there's a lot of, of truth to that. Um, I think that if you look at especially aggression and violence and unethical behavior, they do tend to be perpetrated more by men than women. And this is not just true for animals, it's also true for humans, right? What's interesting, though, is if you look at the give and take dynamics, not once in 10 years of research have I ever found a statistically significant difference between men acting like givers and women acting like givers. They seem to do it at about equal rates. And I was surprised by this initially because we tend to stereotype men as more taking and women as more giving. But it actually tracks really nicely with Alice Eagley and her colleagues' research. They accumulated a couple decades of, of studies of helping behavior, looking at who's more likely to help. And what they found was men and women were equally helpful overall. But that they tended to specialize in helping in different situations. So men did more helping towards strangers and in emergency situations, um, which you could either you know, sort of code as hero or macho or maybe something of the two, whereas women did more helping and giving in close relationships to their families, their friends, and their closest colleagues. And I think that's a lot of the giving that matters in organizations, right? And so it may well be that men at the top, right, they, they didn't feel as concerned about the people who are their key stakeholders as a group of women might have. And if things were different, I think, yeah, we might have had fewer scandals. Um, we don't have a lot of female Fred the Shreds. Um, and I think it would be really, really great to see more women at the top so we can gather those data. With that, let me say a few things as we close. First one is, um, I mentioned the Give and Take website, and one of the things you can also do on that site is you can nominate someone you know to, who you think is a giver, who deserves recognition for it. Um, I've noticed that even in organizations where givers succeed, the takers are often more visible because they're claiming the credit and hogging the spotlight. And I think we need to do something to balance that out, right, so people know they're successful givers as role models. And if you want to embarrass the hell out of a giver you know, feel free to do it that way. Uh, we're going to recognize one giver a week on the site. The other way that I think is more fun is uh, we have these three postcards at the back and you can hand them or mail them to anyone you know who you think has been generous or helpful. Originally they said thank you for being a giver. We were told, quote, that's cheesy <laughs> by several anonymous survey respondents, all male. <laughs> so instead they say congratulations, you're not a taker. 
<laughs> which I thought was more, more fun. So feel free to, to hand those out to anyone you like. Take as many as you want. Um, the other thing I want to say is my personal favorite part of being on Book Tour has been the chance to honor people and recognize those who have been really giving and generous in my life, um, a lot of whom are dormant ties that I haven't connected with for years. And so I would love if I could just take a moment, if you all bear with me, to acknowledge a few people who are amazing givers in this room. First of all, former students, if you would stand up, please. Let's give these people a round of applause. Secondly, colleagues, where are you? All right, we've got a couple, a few more. They're not willing to stand up, but thank you. And then third, we have a few people here from Orion. Virginia and Holly, are you still in the back? Thank you so much. Fourth, I would love to thank Vanessa and Mark for hosting and organizing this shindig. And finally, I want to thank all of you for being here. It's such an honor to have a chance to share some ideas with you, and I look forward to continuing the dialogue. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much for coming, and, and Adam, thank you so much for a really inspiring evening. Um, I had the pleasure of doing an event early on in the day with Adam as well, and I think the thing that I've been struck with so much by this is this, so often in business life we're in this world of what we call zero sum, you know, I win and you lose. We see it throughout corporate life, and I think what Adam is giving us a chance to see is that not just in our home lives, in our community lives, but actually in our working lives, there can be a positive sum game where, you know, I win and you win, and I think that is at odds with so much of what we see in corporate culture. So, Adam, thank you for inspiring us and giving us a very, you know, hard-headed and, and, you know, evidence-based but very compelling and moving and actually heartfelt, you know, explanation of why giving really does matter so much to all of us. So thank you for being here, uh, and thank you again to Adam. Um, just uh, one final closing word. We, we, we do these kind of events regularly, and just to say that in June we're hoping to do an event, I think on the 19th of June, uh, to a screen a film. We often screen films. This one's called Money in Life, and it's looking at the, the, the financial catastrophe and, um, and saying what are the kind of positive things that can come out of that and what are the, the chances we have to rethink our relationship with money and our priorities around, around the economy and indeed life in general. So a really inspiring film. Hope you'll join us on the 19th of June for that and, and many more events later in the year. But thank you again for being here and have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you.